Hello and welcome to Chairside Live. I'm your host, Megan Strong. Thank you for tuning in today. In this episode, Dr. Murashan is presenting a combination crown veneer case on teeth number 7 through 10. She's placing Bruxer Anterior for its strength and durability and its aesthetic appeal. Dr. Mershon is also demonstrating how to avoid common bite registration errors and a unique way to seat multiple restorations all at once. Let's check it out. Take it away, Dr. Mershon. Hello and welcome back for my new Chairside Life episode. I find today's case most interesting because it deals with the restoration of a facial trauma. For the outcome, I will seat and bond four Bruxer anterior restorations simultaneously using a carrier tray. While running on a slippery swimming pool deck at age 11, he lost his footing and landed face first onto the concrete rim, catastrophically fracturing his central incisors. Three of his anterior teeth had to undergo root canal treatment. The treating dentist at the time built them up with composite. Not until age 22 did his previous dentist decided to finally crown 8 and 9, after which he was still not happy with his smile. This led him to seek me out for treatment. Number 7, in fact, had not yet been restored with a crown, but was treated simply with an endo and build-up composite, causing it to show dark when smiling or talking. The facial ceramic of number 8 has started to shear off over time. The shearing of the veneer ceramic created an unreflective matte appearance. Upon further evaluation, it was noted that natural vital tooth number 10 intrinsically retains crazed lines, increasing the risk of fracture. Together with the patient, it was decided that a veneer could be added to the cosmetic treatment to balance out the smile and further protect the tooth. Anytime I see fractured teeth or chipped restoration in the aesthetic zone, my go-to material is a highly translucent monolithic zirconia, such as Bruxer anterior. I proceed with the removal of the old restorations using a zircator burr to cut through these bilayered old ceramic restorations. My treatment plan involved crowning 7, 8 and 9 with Bruxer anterior, as well as placing a Bruxer veneer on number 10. I chose this material in particular because this monolithic form of zirconia can endure the rigors of an intraoral restoration better than the aesthetic core materials with veneering porcelain, specifically because there is no ceramic layer to chip or delaminate, as was the case with number 8. To prepare number 7 for a full crown, I use burrs from the reverse preparation kit by Axis Dental. For the preparation of the veneer on number 10, I use a burr logic set from Brassler USA. Both sets include calibrated burrs to ensure precise depth when cutting into the enamel incisally or facially. For number 10, using a 3-band depth-limiting diamond burr and sinking it into the tooth following the two planes on the labial aspect, I can create a tapered facial reduction. This tooth was in edge-to-edge -edge relationship, so to increase the resistance and retention form, I am reducing the enamel to engage the incisal edge and slightly overlap it palatally. Using depth-limiting burrs, I can ensure that I don't lose the enamel entirely. This is important as I know I will encounter lower durability when bonding a Bruxer veneer to dentin. To position the finish line interproximally, I use a tapered diamond and a fine grid diamond to smooth the facial and interdental areas, rounding any edges. This will avoid incorporating stress in the final restoration. For an accurate impression, I always use the dual core technique followed by gingival compression with camper caps. I have chosen medium and heavy body capture vinyl polysiloxane impression material. As my assistant will removes the second cord, I follow right behind him with the medium body and then quickly fill in the sulcus and all around the preps while he is loading the custom impression tray. Today I would like to take a moment to talk about how I record the bite when I don't use a triple tray. Because I didn't prepare the canines, I verified that the teeth are all in maximum intercuspation position before taking the bite record. 
The impression material I prefer is from the capture system because it is a non-compressible silicone material and has no recoil when the models are articulated together. When I capture by record for a limited number of restorations and have not used a triple tray, I only extrude the silicone over the teeth that have been prepped and then have the patient bite together until all other teeth are in occlusion. This way I know that my bite record will provide the lab with the correct vertical dimension of occlusion. Additionally, if I don't guide the patient to close on the back teeth, then the patient will naturally seek contact on the anterior teeth by sliding the mandible into a more forward position. If this record is taken with the mandible slightly in a forward position, when the lab articulates the models, it will show a decrease in occlusal clearance. As we can compare in these photos, the models are articulated with the silicon record material placed only on the prepared teeth versus a full arch record. Note how there are spaces between canines and less incisal clearance for the veneer on number 10. And when the bite is placed only on the prepared teeth, will allow the patient to more easily locate the MIP, ensuring contact on the canines and more clearance incisally. During the delivery appointment and after the biotems were removed, the restoration were tried in, checked for margin accuracy, contact and occlusion. Then the teeth and restorations were prepared for seating. Staying true to my purpose here at Glidewell, I continue to pursue the advancement of dentistry through research and development to find new ways to be faster and more predictable. I can use this case as an example where I challenge myself to develop a speedier seating process. I use this dental spatula repurposed into an instrument meant to carry all final restoration to sit simultaneously during the bonding procedure. Transparent silicone bite registration material was placed on the flat side of the instrument to secure the crown and the veneer into the correct position. Once the silicone had set, all of the restorations were removed simultaneously and loaded with multi-link cement. After an easy detachment from the tray using an explorer, I verified complete seating of the restorations using wooden sticks. After tack curing for two seconds, the excess cement is removed and a strip of glycerin gel is extruded and light cured once more to prevent the formation of oxygen inhibited layer. The same process could be achieved with a digitally fabricated tray now being demonstrated on the model. The crowns or veneers can be safely nested into the correct position into this tray. Once the looting cement is loaded, all the restoration would be carried and safely seated in the mouth, as you can see sitting it here on the model. This tray uses a palatal and an occlusal stop to ensure optimum placement. It is translucent, so it allows the choice to cure the looting material if the seating is correct or provide easy removal to facilitate cleanup and verification of the correct insertion. I hope you enjoyed this presentation in which, with a minimum number of restorations, I was able to completely transform this patient's smile. The light reflection gives the Broxer anterior material a natural appearance, and since it is in a monolithic form, there is no risk of shearing of the veneer ceramic from its core, a possibility that exists with bilayer materials. The patient was excited for his new smile and we were just as pleased with the result. Thanks for watching. Thank you, Dr. Mershon. Well, that about wraps it up for this episode of Chairside Live. So on behalf of everyone here at Glyber Laboratories, thank you for watching and I'll meet you right back here next time.